Okay. So let's talk about the lab from we need to fix our table actually. yesterday. So here's the big picture. Should I start? So you started off and you had a block and you said, oh, okay, well let's figure out the gravitational pull. So you held it up and you probably got something around two newtons. Okay? So when you're holding this thing up, okay, and you're reading that scale when it's two newtons, there's actually a whole bunch of forces that are taking place at that instant. So obviously gravity is pulling down. Mechanism, eh, a little fuzzy on that. Okay, we know what happens. You get into Einstein and warping space and time. You talk about gravitons, all this good stuff. Basically, we know what happens. It's a little fuzzy on the actual mechanism. So basically, this happens because every particle in this block of wood is attracted to every particle on this rock that we're on. And the sum total of all of those attractions between every particle in here and every particle in the Earth added together is only two newtons. Okay? Relatively, that's a pretty weak amount of force. Okay? Now, so this is one force acting down. So let's look at Newton's three laws. First law is law of inertia. It basically says if this block is sitting here, this block wants to continue to sit here. Yesterday we went out, we kicked the hockey puck, right? The hockey puck kept going in a straight line at a constant speed once you neglected fr friction. So if it's going in a straight line, it wants to keep moving in a straight line. If it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest. So if you're going to make something speed up, slow down, change direction, you have to apply a force. So that's Newton's first law. The second one... Thank you. second one is basically the only one that's mathematical in nature. So the second law is what's hanging up in the back of the room, F equals ma. Technically, and we'll get more into this tomorrow, that is your net force, which is the sum of all of the forces. So net force is mass times acceleration. That's the only one that's mathematical. The third law can be summarized in three words, equal and opposite. Are you just out of here now? I guess. It says 1155. Well, here's the assignment. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to watch the video tonight. Okay. So, have fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you should leave I'm that in the video. Oh, I am. That's, yeah. Good luck, Hunter. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hunter rap. Hashtag I'm screwed. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So. Newton's third law says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. For every force there's an equal and opposite force. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can say that. Now, here's the anomaly about Newton's third law. Is that it's the simplest of all of the laws. Okay? Oh, every force there's an equal and opposite force. But, it, but yet it's the most misunderstood of all of the laws. And we'll get more into that in just a second. So basically, when this block is being pulled down by the earth, guess what? The block is pulling back with an equal and opposite force. Now, the good news is we don't have to worry about the earth starting to accelerate up towards the block because of the fact that it has such a <coughs> large mass. So this here is a set of what we call coupled forces. The earth is pulling down, the block is pulling back up. That's a set of equal and opposite forces. The block then is pulling down on the spring. The spring is pulling back up. So there's a set of equal and opposite forces. Now, this is what we call action at a distance. The earth isn't in direct contact with the block. So something has to be causing that force. Gravitons, warping the space and time, whatever it is. 
So this is a non-contact set of equal and opposite forces, whereas when, when it's directly in contact with it, that's a set of contact equal and opposite forces. Okay? But now, listen to me, there's a key word in this. For every force, there is an equal and opposite force. This isn't just on Tuesdays at noon and when I'm talking about the concept, okay? There's no caveat about, oh, this only applies on certain days of the week. It's Newton's third law. This isn't a suggestion, okay? This isn't, well, kind of, if it's convenient, if it makes sense, we're good. If not, hey, don't worry about it. No, this is a law, okay? It's kind of important. That is a law. Now, let me explain where a common misconception happens. So, you got gravity pulling down at two newtons, and then you have your force normal up here at two newtons, okay? Right? Cool. Beautiful. Life's grand. Now, in this situation, the normal force is actually provided by the table. So, th in this situation, there's a contact here. The block is actually resting on the table. So then you've got your force applied, that might be, I don't know, somebody has like 0.50 newtons and then your force friction is negative 0.5 newtons, okay? Now, everybody says, oh, this is Newton's third law. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. This isn't Newton's third law. Newton's third law would apply when you're pulling on that block and you're exerting a force of 0.5 newtons the block is pulling back with you at 0.5 newtons. Now, stay with me here. We're going to take a quick detour <laughs> into history. So as legend has it, and I'm a former artist, okay? But so imagine that, okay, my, these, It's a horse drawn buggy. Okay. So, thanks. So, this is the legend of Newton's horse. Okay. So, as legend has it, and again, it's a legend, and don't sit there and go, is this a horse? No. Just stay with the story. So, as legend has it, Newton has published his works called the Principia. So, and it's, pub it's actually written in Latin, because at the time, all scientific papers were written in Latin. Because that was like the universal language of, of science. Because you had you know, people working in Germany and England and Poland, and they said, okay, hey, what's the universal language? They said, okay, let's just choose Latin. Okay, so everybody wrote the papers in Latin. So, the paper's been published, all this good stuff, and it's famous, right? So, he goes to go into town, get a spot of tea, maybe. And so he hooks up the horse, and he goes, Yah, horse. And the horse says, whoa there, big boy, easy with the reins. Okay? So Newton is shocked for any number of reasons. Number one, the horse has turned around and he's talking to him. And the horse says, okay, look, here's Sparky. I read your work, which is impressive because it was written in Latin. And the horse says, let's talk about your third law of motion. Because if I pull on the wagon, the wagon's just going to pull back on me with an equal and opposite force. Therefore, I can't make the wagon move, so just back off with the reins thing, okay? Because according to your law, not suggestion, if I pull on the wagon, the wagon pulls back on me, I can't make the wagon moon or move, so let's just stay here and I'm going to chill out and eat grass. So, how do you argue with the horse? <clears throat> Straight from the horse's mouth. Smack hey, No. Hey. Argue, not beat. <laughs> Intellect, <laughs> not raw force. <laughs> or is the horse right? <laughs> For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. Yeah. So if the horse pulls on the wagon, the wagon pulls back with an equal and opposite force, therefore, we can't move the wagon. 
which also means that they're stuck in here for eternity because if you go to push on that door, the door is going to push back with an equal and opposite force and you'll never be able to open up the door. Kind of no acceleration, but yet not. Okay. Obviously, we can get things to move, right? Obviously, that happens. You all pulled the door open to walk in this room. When the bell rings, you all are going to push the door open and you're going to make the door open. So obviously the horse is not right. Because if that was the case, we'd never be able to make, you know, for, for however many hundreds of years, horse-drawn carriages would never be able to move. The horse would be going, well, we'll try, but I'm not going to get anywhere. Okay? No, obviously the horse is wrong. But now let me, let me pose this idea. For those of you that have played football, Mr. Taylor, okay, why do you wear cleats? More traction. More traction. Have you ever pushed the blocking sled? Yeah. Okay, now, so let's say hypothetically, Coach Guzman says, Mr. Taylor, I need you to hit the blocking sled, and you go, whoa, Coach, I'm in physics. Burkham says if I push the blocking sled, it's going to push back on me with an equal and opposite force. I can't push the blocking sled. I'm going to go show out and have some Gatorade. Well, first off, don't roll me into the bus because the newsman would kill you. So, but you can push the blocking sled, right? You can make it move. So why would that be more difficult if you were wearing, like, normal, like, let's say, for example, the sandals that you have on? Why would that be more difficult? Um, I wouldn't be able to stick my feet to the ground to move. I'd be sliding. Okay. When you push on the ground, does the ground push back on you? Yeah, it does. Because yeah. if it doesn't, you're going to fall. Right? So when you wear cleats, what are you making? What, what, how does the cleat make a difference versus those sandals? <coughs> what do the cleats allow you to do? You said it. What do, they, what do you have? More traction, right? So when you push back on the earth, you can push back with more of a force, and then that force that forces the earth to push back on you with more of a force in the opposite direction, right? So here's the deal. You have to look at these forces being coupled. The horse would be right if the horse was standing on ice, okay? If this was a friction of the surface, the horse would be right. Because, dude, if I try and pull, I can't get anywhere. Okay, the horse would be right if this was frictionless. But if you've ever seen horses, they put horseshoes on horses because horseshoes on horses are like cleats to a football player or a soccer player or any athlete. You increase that coefficient of friction. So when the horse pushes on the earth, the earth pushes back with a set of equal and opposite forces. The horse is right. When the horse when the horse pulls on the wagon, the wagon pulls back with an equal and opposite force. But as long as this set of forces here that are equal and opposite is greater than this set of forces here that are equal and opposite, the horse can pull the wagon. That's what allows you to push the door open. Now, if I made the door, the, the, the floor, right in front of the door frictionless, and you go to push on the door, what would happen? You're going to accelerate backwards. So what allows you to open up that door is because there is a set of forces that exist between you and the floor that's bigger than when you pull on the handle to open up the door. Okay, so the horse is right. The horse just has to look at the big picture. Okay, got it? Good, frame. So when you go back to something being moved at a constant velocity, this isn't Newton's third law. This is making the forces add up equal to zero. So one of your diagrams is going to look like this. Okay, that free body diagram. I should clearly be able to see the scale that you used. Did you let one centimeter equal a Newton? Did you let two centimeter equal a Newton? What did you do? I should clearly see what every force is. Should be drawn with a ruler, not just kind of randomly freehand. So this is what one of them should look like. The other one is going to look when you draw that tip to tail, okay? Your fat, your normal, your, okay? So there should be four there. 
Just don't draw a rectangle because a vector without an arrowhead doesn't tell me anything. I got to know which direction these vectors are pointing. So this is what the second diagram is going to look like. Then you went to the force table, and that should look something like this, kind of like spokes on a wheel. A, B, and C, vector A, vector B, vector C, and then you can draw that tip to tail. Now, here's the deal with this particular situation. Because it's in equilibrium, that doesn't mean that there aren't forces. So when I tell you why doesn't it accelerate, don't tell me, oh, the force, the force equals zero. Okay? The forces don't equal zero here. You can say the sum of the forces equals zero. You can say it's at equilibrium. But don't tell me, oh, the forces are zero because you've got a whole bunch of forces acting on this system. Okay? So, your second diagram is going to be this tip to tail, it should look like a triangle. And then the, the, the fifth thing you're going to need to hand in is that graph where you plotted force friction on, y, on the y-axis and your normal force on the x-axis and you should see the slope of that line gives you the coefficient of friction. Okay? Alright? Cool with that. Now, let's talk about some of the problems. So. You've got mu equaling force friction over force normal. Don't make this normal a complicated thing to find. Anytime you have the mass, you can find the normal force by doing what? Brooklyn, what can I do to find my normal force anytime I have my mass? Do to? Gravity. So on a flat surface, normal is the same as your gravitational pull, which is mg. Now, when you get to a question like number seven on the front, okay, cars traveling at a thousand kilograms, 10 meters per second, I've given you mu based upon these values. What is the value of friction for acting on the car? So here's the deal. Go back to the idea of a velocity time graph. What's the velocity time graph going to look like for this car? It's going to start at 10. What's it going to do? Liz, it's going to do what? Yeah, it's going to go like this, right? Here's that amount of, some amount of time. What's the sign of my acceleration going to be? Negative. So I'm going to have some negative acceleration. So here's the deal. This force friction is what's going to create that acceleration. So anytime you have a force friction, to find that force friction, one thing you can do is multiply mass by the acceleration that it causes. Now, remember, this is an absolute value, okay? This is an absolute value, okay? That's all it is. This is an absolute value. So when you get the force friction, your force <coughs> friction coming out of here is always going to be a positive number always going to be a positive number. But what you need to do is look at it in the context of the problem. Okay, right. i got positive velocity. I'm slowing down. I've got to have negative acceleration. The only way I can have negative acceleration is if I have negative force. Okay? I have negative force. Therefore, you just get the number, and then you just have to realize, oh, I've got to make it negative because of the fact that I'm slowing down with positive velocity. So your answer to number seven should be a negative number, and should, so should your answer to number eight. Now, when you get to question number ten, okay? When you get to question number ten, the two most important words on an all of number ten is the word constant velocity. Okay, those are the two most important words. Every force problem that you are going to do is one of two things, and only one of two things only. You're either going to accelerate, and you're going to use at some point net force equals mass times acceleration, or it's at a constant velocity where all of the forces balance out. Those are the only two options that you have on every problem you are going to do. Listen to me. Those are your only two options. So as soon as you see constant velocity, you go, oh, simple. I balance out all the forces. If you're accelerating, like on number nine, 
the forces aren't balanced out. Okay? So, when you look at number 10, and one of the things that you've got to start getting in the habit of doing is making a simple sketch. So, if you come up to me and you say, ah, Mr. Burkamp, I don't have you number 10. Here's the first question I'm going to ask you. Have you drawn a picture that shows all of the forces acting on the object? And if you say no, I'm going to politely say, go draw the pictures and then I'll help you. Because if you don't know what the forces are and which direction that they're acting, you're screwed. You can't fix, you cannot solve the problem. So you don't have to draw it to scale, but at least get some idea of what the forces are. So when you look at number 10, what are the four forces do you think that are going to be acting on number 10? There's going to be four of them. Mara, what's one of them? Okay, so here's my block, car, whatever it is. Okay, so let's say we're going this way. There's the direction of my velocity. Which direction is friction going to act? Don't make this difficult. The block's going this way. Which direction is friction going to act? Yeah, okay, so I've got some force friction. Okay? What's another one? Ellie. Normal force. Normal, natural, okay, FN. Hallie, what's another one? Gravity. Yeah, okay, got some FG action. Now, if this, is, if this was all that was acting, if this were your force diagrams, could this thing be moving at constant velocity? As, as it is right now, could this thing be moving at a constant velocity? No. Why? Well, they're not balanced. If you added them together, would you get zero? No. So what's going to happen is that this thing is going to accelerate. Okay? So there is no way, with, if these are the forces that were acting, I could not have constant velocity. It would not work. Okay? Would not work. I could have accelerated motion, but I couldn't have constant velocity. So, if you're at a constant velocity, what else do I need? Joseph, what else do I need? What'd you say? Yes, so I need a fourth force. What, what fourth force? Beautiful, okay? So, I need my force supply. So, if you look what information you have on number 10, okay, you're going, wow. I don't know what my force applied is, but you know what the coefficient of friction is, right? So you're given that mu equals force friction over force normal. I can multiply mu by force normal to get my force friction. So as soon as I find my force friction, I have my force applied. Okay? So as soon as you have one, you automatically have the other one as long as you were at constant velocity, okay? That's the cold key. Now, one of the things that we'll talk about today is this very horrible drawing that I have over there that's supposed to be a Jedi Knight, so give the camera a quick deal. Underneath the incl inclinatio at quitum is Jedi Stofawa, okay? So what the Stofawa stands for is stop the force and watch, okay? So this, as we go through forces, this is going to be a key concept that we're going to talk about. So if you want to figure out what the true motion of an object is, stop applying a force and watch what happens. And you can apply this in any number of situations. So here I've got a golf ball, right? So if I stop applying the force that it takes to lift it up, if I stop that force and watch what happens, what does it begin to do? It begins to accelerate. Which means there has to be what? Keep going, Howie. There has to be what? Gravity. Yeah, it down. exactly. There has to be some other force that's making it move in that direction. Now, if I could let go of it and at that very instant shut off the gravity in this very area, if I let go of it and I could shut off gravity in that instant, what would it do? 
just stay there, right? It would just float. Because of the fact that there, was, there would not be any force to cause an acceleration. So if I'm pulling this block and I stop my applied force, if I stop that applied force, what's it going to begin to do? Accelerate. Because what's still there? What force is still there? If I lose my applied force, as long as it's still moving, what force is still there? Friction. Friction. And that's what's going to make it slow down. That's why when you're pulling a block, okay, you stop pulling, it begins to accelerate. You're driving your car. You run out of gas. You stop the force. What happens to the car? <laughs> it starts to slow down. It accelerates, right? Because you've lost the applied force. So if you're not sure if a force is necessary for motion, stop applying the force and see what happens. Okay? Here, I let go of the force. Hey, it accelerates. That means there's something else has to be there. Okay? Good with that. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Number, uh, number eight on the other station. What are the three ways to determine the force friction? On the, the first station, the uh, static friction line. Very top of the back page. Yeah? I'm not really sure how to handle static friction. Do you have Mu? Yes. It's, it's the same car, so it's the same force going. Whether it's mu or static, it doesn't make any difference. It's still the same coefficient of friction. So there, there's no, there isn't like, the coefficient for static friction is calculated the exact same way the coefficient of kinetic friction is. Okay? All right, anything else? Once, twice, sold, boom. Get those hands. All right. So here's the next big thing. We got a couple of demos to do in the back to kind of talk and reinforce this whole idea of Newton's third three laws. So the first thing that's going to happen in the back of the room, there's a bed of nails. Okay. What? So I'm going to lay on the bed of nails. I'm going to have Mr. Taylor. Okay. Smash a concrete block that's laying on my chest <laughs> while I'm laying on a bed of nails. Don't miss. Okay? Don't miss. Have you seen the video where the. Yeah. Even today is a chance. It was stupid. Yeah, I know. It's bad. I would have seen that. It was just stupid the way he did it. It was stupid for any number of reasons. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's talk about what's going to happen in, ter in terms of Newton's three laws, okay? Newton's first law is what? Law of inertia. Objects at rest want to remain at rest, right? Now, when you talk about inertia, there is one thing and one thing only that determines the amount of inertia an object has, and that is the mass of the object. The more stuff there is in it, the harder it is to get it to move. But once it gets moving, it's harder to stop. Okay? So I'm going to be laying there, concrete block on my chest. I have a certain amount of mass. I have a certain amount of inertia. So my body wants to remain at rest because that's the state of motion that it's in. Okay? So let's define down as being negative, up as being positive, okay? So, Jake's going to come down with the sledgehammer and he's going to hit the block, right? So, do I want to accelerate or do I want to remain at a relatively constant velocity? Remain. Yeah, I don't want big accelerations. I don't want to accelerate, right? Because if I accelerate, I'm going to be accelerating downward into a bed of very, very sharp objects which is not going to end well. I am wearing a dark shirt, but I just don't want blood on it. So I don't want a lot of acceleration, okay? I want to minimize my acceleration. So he's going to come down. So here's the sledgehammer, right? He's going to drop the hammer. So his velocity is going to be positive, coming down like this. So when he hits it, 
what sign do I want the acceleration of the sledgehammer to have? Positive or negative? Negative. Why? I want it to slow down. I don't want the sledgehammer to have positive acceleration. That would be bad. Okay? Because that means the sledgehammer is going to hit the block of wood and continue to speed up and go farther into my chest. Bad. Are you wearing okay? any sort of like vest or protection, or are you just relying on physics? Just physics. That's a true physics teacher right there. Yes, <laughs> true idiot. Okay. Actually, I've got faith in Now, so here's the deal. So he's going to come and apply a certain amount of force to the block in my chest. By Newton's third law, when he hits with a certain amount of force, the block has to exert an equal and opposite force, right? So here's the deal. We're defining down as being positive. I'm going to have, hopefully, a small amount of positive acceleration in that direction. I want the sledgehammer to have a big acceleration that's pointing upward, right? So if you look at Newton's third law, F equals ma. So from my perspective, I'm going to have a pretty big mass, so I want, hopefully, a small positive acceleration. Okay? I want the sledgehammer, which relatively is going to have a small amount of mass, I want that to have a pretty big negative acceleration. So both objects are going to have the same force applied to them. The sledgehammer is going to have a certain amount of force applied to it. My chest is going to have a certain amount of force applied to it. I want the sledgehammer to have a negative acceleration and slow down. I want a small acceleration, but I don't want to speed up very much. Okay? Got it. Life's good. Okay, so take that. Here we go. So lay it flat this way. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, there should be a face shield up there. Okay. Now, use the dull wind. Okay. Yeah, that's not going to be sharp end. That's cool with the dull wind. Now, give him room, okay, for this deal. Now, <laughs> yeah, you're not trying to, you know, ring the bell at the state carnival, but you can give it, you can give it a pretty decent hit. Is he on break? I hope so, because I'm actually, I actually, I want it to break because that's going to dissipate some of that energy, because if it doesn't break, then all the energy is going into my chest. And, then I get and that's bad. Okay? So like I said, you can give it a half to three quarter swing. Okay? Just don't miss. Okay? Are you good with this? You seem somewhat hesitant. Yeah, let's go. Okay, because my life is on the line, and you're great. Okay. And you're great. Thank you, Pastor. And you're great. Okay. All right. You ready? Okay. How many times are your physics? Wow. Yeah. Broke the face mask. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. No. Okay. Just another day in the office. Oh my gosh! I don't like that. Yeah, happens in the department all the time. Okay. <laughs> wow, you told him to. So I know. I know. Oh, okay. Well, you definitely broke it. Oh, it broke. It shattered, actually. I just powdered it. Okay. That was good. Nicely done. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> look cool. I'm slow mo. Oh, you can see you, oh, yourself you can see. like tense up. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. You, flex, <laughs> you flex so much that the block actually like flies up. Watch. <laughs> Yeah. Get 
it's the slow one. I think that actually. <laughs> Again. Again. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, he were off by just a little bit. But it was horrible. I think okay. that actually no, made it worse because it like flew off that of you and then it like came back. Out. Yeah. But it wasn't all. Yeah, you know, one time I did this. I was at a grade school. Yeah, it's they're sharp. Uh, and I had a lab coat on, and the shirt I had on underneath was red, or excuse me, was white. And I had taken a marker and make little red dots all the way across my back. <laughs> so when I got done, I stood up and had my back to him and I took off my jacket. You know, these little, these gray school kids go, oh my and god, I'm bleeding. It's like, oh, it's post. just a joke. Come on. And that's, yeah. I was most invited back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, hold on. Now we got to move to here. Oh. Oh, oh, that's not safe at all. Well, that's, you have a very important job. Okay. Okay. So, Kendra, I need your yeah, I like, assistance. Okay. Okay, so what we're basically going to do is make a small torpedo. Okay. Okay. So, I need, I'm going to hold this up. I need you to tape this to those two pieces of straw. Okay, and take that one. There you go. Okay. All right. So, when I let go of this, what's it going to do? Would accelerate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which implies there has to be a... Force. force, right? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to time this, okay? Get an idea of how long it's going to take to go from from this point over to there. Look right. at Ellie. <laughs> so if you guys want to play along, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm only really going to I have her number. Okay. All right. So we're going to go three, two, one, go. You ready? Okay. Three, two. One, go. Not cool. What'd you get? 1.68. Okay. 1.69. Okay. So about 1.7 seconds, right? So it actually took off pretty fast. So I'm going to drag this back. Now I'm going to do it a second time. So we're going to blow it up to the same size. Pull that. Is that a brand new balloon? Well, it was, and now it's torn. We broke okay. it. Okay, <laughs> let me go get another balloon. Hold on. There's a little piece of it right there. <laughs> you don't get it sharp. There's like 100 pounds of nails in it. So he did. the nails are in there. Yeah, probably 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 That's why they, they probably nailed it. Okay. <laughs> but now, here's what we're going to do different. Oh, okay. Oh, man. So now we're in effect going to put a blast shield back here. Okay? Oh, it's going to go so much faster. Okay, so hold on. Do the balloons that make noises? No, we should. Okay. Now, so here's my question. Why are you messing with my marshmallows? I'll protect these from Mr. Burkham, don't you? Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to do this again. So what do you think is going to happen to the amount of time? It's going to get shorter. Okay, so you had 1.7, right? Yep. So what are you predicting now? 0.75. So a whole second less. Like 0.90. <laughs> Two thirds of the time. Yep. 0.90. I'm going with. Okay. So all right. So now Garfield. So what's going to have to change to make the time less? Uh, the amount of force. Increase or decrease? Increase. So, by putting this here, you think there's going to be more force? Yeah. With more force, same mass, I'm going to get 
less time. Because I'm going to get a bigger acceleration. Bigger acceleration. So the distance is the same, right? So does anybody else have a different number? So here's your three options. The time could be less because we get a bigger force and a bigger acceleration. The time could be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I don't like our field. Okay. Or the time could be longer. Okay. So are you ready? So we'll do this again. Okay. Make sure you blew it up the same amount. It's the ex look. It's the exact same amount. Are you sure? It's the exact same amount. Measure it. Okay. Okay. You ready? Three, two, one, go. Oh my God. Yep. Point nine zero. Oh, that's not what I got. I have 1.19. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Okay. I got 1.25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you also have 1.25. So, here's what should have happened. It shouldn't have made any difference at all. The time should have been the exact same. Okay? And here's the reason why. Don't get cocky. Okay? Your justification was that you just because like you didn't him. like him. That's not a scientific justification. So... Let's look at what had to happen <clears throat> to make the acceleration happen to begin with. So, where am I? Okay. So, first off, let's talk what's happening inside the balloon, right? So here's the balloon. What's causing the balloon to even have its shape? On an atomic level, what's happening? Hydrogen. <laughs> What's happening? Hydrogen <laughs> is in the balloon. And H. There was a. What are the two main gases in our atmosphere? Oxygen, Oxygen and nitrogen. Okay? Both of those are diatomics, right? Okay? So basically, what's happening is that within this balloon, all of these little particles are bouncing off. So is there a force exerted on the inside of the balloon? Yes. Yes, because if there isn't, what would happen? The balloon would just be flat. And that'd be depressing. Yes. So all of these particles are bouncing off the sides of the balloon. Now, they're really small. It isn't like, you know, it isn't like you hit it and then you see like naturally like the dip will come up on the side of the balloon. It's smooth. But there's a whole bunch of them. There's billions upon billions upon billions of these little nitrogen and oxygen molecules bouncing around. They have a certain amount of what we call kinetic energy. They're hitting the sides. Boom, here we go. So when I let go of the end of it, what changes? They go out. Well, they go out. Are, they st are the particles still hitting the front of the balloon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are, right? But are they hitting the back of the balloon? No. 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 So they're going out this way. So it's actually creating the force to make it go forward is because you have them hitting the front of the balloon, but you don't have them hitting the back, the back of the balloon. And that's what makes it accelerate. So when you put that shield here, this is where you think this through. And everybody says, oh, the shield should make it go faster. Well, here's the deal. Once these particles exit the back of the balloon, they are going to bounce off this. I'll give you that. They're going to hit and they're going to bounce back. But at that point, where's the balloon? The balloon's going this way. So even though it hits this, there's no way to transfer that force back to the balloon. Okay? It's not there. The balloon's going, I'm out of here. So how do you explain the eye uh, It was just because of the fact that, okay, number one, it was a different balloon, okay? And maybe I had the, the straws lined up better where there was less friction. I don't know. I think there's definitely a little bit of no, no, no. particles. The, the, there is no physical way that that shield created an additional force for it to go forward. You don't Even care. right off the bat? No. I went right off the bat. Still there. Because how much, how much like, time have you spent in this theory? 
Well, <laughs> there isn't really a theory. It's Newton's sort of law. Then how do you explain the time? It was just literally because I think it was a different balloon. Maybe so the opening was was off. different. Something happened. So but can we try without? Yeah, can we like okay, do it again? Okay, let's try it again. I'll try it again. Okay. <laughs> Same we'll cat try like it again. Flexes, same balloon. Okay. Same cat like flexes. Oh, oh, I don't I was like going to try and do that until it hit me with the balloon, but that didn't work. So, how does this correlate with like. Never mind. Just kidding. It's the muscles. Yep. Alright, so you can't be sure to rig it this time. So <laughs> okay. So, we'll try and put it back in the same. Kind of position. You should probably measure how long. Do you think that looks bigger? How long the balloon is? Yeah. I think that balloon looks bigger. Except that would make me. I like Reese now. Oh, I was like, cool. Sounds cool. I like Reese. Okay, so we'll try this again. You ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, three, two, one, go. That oh, was, that was so <laughs> much slower. Oh, okay. Oh, it was, oh, <laughs> Mr. Perkins. It was spinning around like a corkscrew. <laughs> That's because it didn't have to force The tape it. wasn't tight enough. It was like the older tape. Yes. Oh, now we're going to blame it on hey, the what tape. Was it was the tape. What do you mean? What was in there? Water. Why does it smell weird? <laughs> <laughs> That's you. It's salty. I think there's because I had vinegar to clean my fingers so that I got a better seal on there to make it work. I definitely think there's more research to be done on this one. Okay, Garfield, <laughs> Garfield, if this was the case, then we could not navigate in space. The equal and opposite reaction happens inside the balloon. By your justification, when you're out in space, if you don't have something to push against, then well, it, it doesn't... But it still goes, it's proven. Stop! <laughs> The set of equal and opposite forces. I'll come back with a better theory tomorrow. Okay, you come back with a better theory. Okay, back we go. We're good? Yes, fine. Right, Hunter can deal with the angle. What? Okay. It's fine. It's fine. All right, it's fine. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Pop your head. It's okay. So, every, when you go through what's going to happen on this assignment, literally, Every problem is going to be one of two things. If it's an accelerated motion, that means when you add up all of the forces, you don't get zero, and at some point you're going to use F equals MA. That's it. If you're at a constant velocity, you make all the forces add up to zero. There is nothing in between. What? You got to put it across. There you go. Does not equal zero. Okay? Literally, that's it. All the forces. So you either, if you're accelerating, you don't make the forces add up equal to zero, or if you're constant velocity, you make them add up equal to zero. That's it. There is nothing else. Okay? That is the only thing in town. So let's say that you've got a uh, carrot car, right? And it's got an initial velocity of zero. You want to make this speed, this thing speed up to 10 meters per second in two seconds. Is it going to accelerate? Yes. yes. So therefore, I can use F equals ma. Now, do you know the acceleration? No. Can you find the acceleration? Yes. Yes. So this is why you have to figure out acceleration equations before you can do force problems. So this is simple. Oh, I'm speeding up. I've got a positive velocity. Therefore, I have to have positive acceleration. I take 10 minus 0. I get 10. I divide that by 2. I got 5 meters per second squared. Boom. There's my acceleration. Multiply that by the mass. Voila. There you go. Now. Let's say that that takes two seconds. Could I also calculate the distance that I travel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do I need that to calculate the force? No. No, but I could find that, okay? I can either find the area underneath the triangle. I could use V squared equals V naught squared plus uh, 2AX. I could use the time, however you wanted to do it. Now, 
After this point, let's say then I'm going to maintain a constant velocity of 10 meters per second. So I'm going to speed up and then I'm going to set my cruise control at 10. Okay? What then becomes my acceleration? Zero. 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 So at that point, I'm, I'm still applying the force because there's still friction. But all that means is that at that point, if I begin to maintain that constant velocity, then whatever force I apply is doing nothing but balancing out the frictional force working against it. Now, at that point, I'd say, hey, I'm going to take my foot off the gas. I'm going to put the car in neutral. So you go back to this Jedi Stofelot. You stop applying the force. What's it going to begin to do? It's going to begin to slow down because there is friction. friction. Okay. What does W A mean? Huh? Watch. Watch. Stop the force and watch. Why is he a Jedi? Huh? Why is he a Jedi? Because it involves the force. Uh, his lightsaber is a little small. Okay, back off. Okay. That was a sword. So, it's like a dagger. Yeah. So it's more like a shade. Yeah, well, back off. Amazing. Back off, my Jedi. I drew that in like five seconds. I can tell. That's impressive. Okay. All right, so stop that. Let me hand up. I feel like definitely like in the vacuum of space, since there's nothing to slow down, then just go for that. Okay. Are we rolling? Okay, now let's talk about question number six. Or otherwise, well, I'm going to take you through and I'm going to show you exactly how to work question number six. Question six. Question six. Because if, if it says if with no friction the force F results in acceleration A when accelerating on mass N, then tripling the mass and increasing the force sixfold will result in acceleration of okay. And you all read that and you flip out because you go, oh my god, there's no numbers. What was me? What am I to do? So I want to show you the two different ways that you can work question number six. Okay? So first off, you're accelerating. So you can use F equals N A. So there's two ways that you can work this problem. One of them is smash mouth physics, okay? And you just put in the numbers. So what's the easiest force that's non-zero value that you could work with? One. 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 Okay. I want one new. What's the easiest mass that I could choose? One. One kilogram. So therefore, my acceleration has to be one meter per second squared. Okay, so this is my initial set of conditions. I could have chosen 2 and 0.5, okay? I could have chosen 10, 5, and 2. doesn't make any difference. I just choose, chose this set because it's an easy number to work with, okay? Now, this is my initial set. Then I look at what's going to change. So then I'm told that, okay, I'm going to triple the mass. So my mass now becomes what? Three. Three kilograms. What happens to my force? It increases by a factor of six fold, so this becomes six newtons. So therefore, my acceleration has to be two, two, two meters per second squared, which is twice what it was to begin with. Okay? Now, that's an option. It's smash mouth physics, it works, it's not very elegant, but if you like that process, go with that process. Now, here's the more elegant way to approach it, and it's actually simpler. You sit there and go, okay, here's my initial conditions. F equals MA. Right? Boom. That's all I have. So now, all I'm told is that I'm going to triple the mass. So how can I show a tripling of my mass? Three of them. What's going to happen to my force? It's going to go up to 6F, therefore to make this balance, my acceleration has to be 2 a. Okay? So if you like the more elegant approach, go with this. If you like smash mouth physics, make up numbers, put them in. Okay? I don't care what happens. Now, a couple of things. Let's talk about number 4. Okay? There's a whole bunch to question number four. So I got a point or 500 gram mass placed on a scale. What should the reading be? Okay. 
So what are you going to do with the 500 grams? Change that into? Kilograms. Change, multiply that by G, boom. So, and the, as you're told, the scale measure is in newtons. So then, on, let's talk about 6, or excuse me, 4C. A helium-filled balloon is tied to the mass by a string, and the reading on the scale now reads 4.9 newtons. Okay? So here's the deal. If I've got this big massive 0.5 kilogram mass and I tie a helium balloon to it, assuming that the helium balloon isn't like a weather balloon, okay, it's just like this little helium balloon, is it going to lift up the 0.5 kilogram mass? No, okay, it won't. But here's the deal. The forces still have to add up to equal to zero because the mass, that 0.5 kilogram mass, isn't going to be accelerated. Okay, so when you look at problem number four, there is no acceleration. Always make the forces add up to zero. Now, when you get to number five, notice I put in big bold letters or underline constant velocity, five meters per second. I've given you the coefficient of friction 0.38, how much horizontal force must be applied. So knowing the coefficient of friction and the mass of the blocks, or the mass of the box, what can you find? Yeah, because you can take mu times force normal to get your force friction. Okay? On the back side, and yes, there is the back side. Why do you do this question? Because I can't. Why? Number six is the easiest question on the entire assignment. Do not make number six difficult. It is the easiest problem on the entire assignment. All you have to do is use F equals MA. Do not make it difficult. Okay? Now, when you get to question number nine, there's a whole bunch of information on this question that you don't need. Okay? You don't need to know that it's 1955. That isn't the year. Don't try and plug that in for time. Okay? So, he's going to fall. His chute isn't going to open. He's going to land in the snow, and he's going to leave a crater 1.07 meters deep, which is about yay deep. Okay? So, when he hits the bottom of the crater, what's his final velocity? Zero. Zero. Okay? He's going to land at 53.6 meters per second. So, he's going to go from 53.6 meters per second to zero. Is he going to accelerate when he hits the snow? Yes, you also have a distance. So knowing two velocities and a distance, how can you calculate an acceleration? That equation. That then once you get the acceleration from that equation, you have the mass, there's your frictional force. Pay attention to the signs of force and acceleration. If you have positive velocity and you're slowing down, you better have negative acceleration and negative force. If you have negative acceleration and you're, and, and, excuse me, if you have negative velocity and you're slowing down, you better have positive acceleration. Okay, I'm done. You're on your own. Answers on the left, work on the right. Nothing on this sheet. Nothing on this sheet. What about our notes, though? No, I'm just saying what I'm going to grade. You can write and do whatever you want, but nothing is answered on this sheet.